Hello, everyone. Welcome to this beautiful Sunday service. We are coming from Grace Gospel Church of North York on June 6, 2021. This is first Sunday of the month, so we'll have communion. So please prepare the elements if you haven't prepared yet. And I hope that you would be blessed as you've joined uh, to this beautiful body of Christ to worship the Lord Jesus Christ. Opening scripture comes from Book of Matthew, chapter 24, verse 42. Therefore, keep watch, because you do not know on what day your Lord will come. Let's lift up this service in prayer. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we um, are so grateful every day because we have our Lord Jesus Christ in our life. Everything on this earth can never give anyone eternal security, certainty about happiness. Everything on this earth will fade away with her momentary, leaving us bigger void in our heart. But in your grace, you have given us the best gift that anyone can ever receive, that is gift of faith in Jesus Christ that he died on the cross for our sin and rose from that, that he is indeed the son of God who came to pay the penalty of our sin in order to give us gift of forgiveness and gift of eternal life. And you want us to share this message unto many others. Thank you, Lord, for giving us heart and passion to pass it on. We'll be hearing at this time a message regards being watchful, how we have to be alert and sober in our mind, that live our life in anticipation of your coming. We have said over and over, placing emphasis that you're coming like deep in the night. So no matter what hour, what day it may be, we as believers are to live our life being attentive of your coming at any time. May God the Holy Spirit compel our heart to receive your message as your servant speaks. Thank you, Lord, for sending us Reverend Ted, precious servant, to deliver his message, Lord God, that he's prepared by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. May we all have childlike mind and heart to receive your message, completely trusting of your word that's written in your word. May you unite this body as one, in one spirit, in one mind. May we build your church, being watchful of your coming, and being diligent in earnest, sharing your gospel to many others. Thank you, Lord, for making this time possible for all of us, Lord God, and bless this time as we lean our ears to listen to your message. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Today's message comes from Book of Luke, chapter 12, verse 35 to 48. Be dressed ready for service and keep your lamps burning like servants waiting for their master to return from a wedding banquet, so that when he comes and knocks, they can immediately open the door for him. It will be good for those servants whose master finds them watching when he comes. Truly, I tell you, he will dress himself to serve, will have them reclined at the table, and will come and wait on them. It will be good for those servants whose master finds them ready, even if he comes in the middle of the night or toward daybreak. But understand this, if the owner of the house had known at what hour the thief was coming, he would not have let his house be broken into. You also must be ready because the son of man will come at an hour when you do not expect him. Peter asked, 
Lord, are you telling this parable to us or to everyone? The Lord answered, who then is a faithful and wise manager whom the master puts in charge of his servants to give them their food allowance at the proper time. It will be good for the servant whom the master finds doing so when he returns. Truly I tell you, he will put him in charge of all his possessions. But suppose the servant says to himself, my master is taking a long time in coming. He then begins to beat the other servants, both men and women, and to eat and drink and get drunk. The master of that servant will come on a day when he does not expect him and at an hour he's not aware of. He will cut him to pieces and assign him a place with the unbelievers. The servant who knows the master's will and does not get ready and does not do what the master wants will be beaten with many blows. But the one who does not know and does things deserving punishment will be beaten with few blows. From everyone who has been given much, much will be demanded. And from the one who has been entrusted with much, much more will be asked. This is the word of God. Reverend Ted will give us a message titled Watchfulness. Good morning, everyone. I hope you're all doing well and that God has given you much grace and mercy during these days. Recently, I've been getting some feedback from a group that mentioned that they felt that all my uh, illustrations, pictures, and some of the stories was a bit distracting in my sermons. So today I just want to let you know I'm going to have a little experiment. Uh, just for this sermon at least, I will mainly be using words on my PowerPoint. So I hope you don't mind, and I'd love to get some feedback from all of you. Uh, email me, send me some text, uh, WhatsApp, whatever. Okay, thanks very much, and I'm, I'm looking forward to getting some feedback from you. We are now continuing our 2021 series on discipleship called the Disciples Manual from the book of Luke. From a section in Luke where Jesus is training his disciples, discipling his disciples, to prepare them for his departure, to take over leadership of the church. We're now at the stage of Luke chapter 12. About two weeks ago, Pastor Michelle did a wonderful message on a rich fool, Luke 12, 13, 21, where she talked about being rich towards God. Then uh, we will talk about today watchfulness, Luke chapter 12, verses 35 to 48, where it mentions in verse 37, it will be good for those servants whose masters find them watching when he comes. Next week, Pastor Michelle will continue on in Luke chapter 12. It's a little bit out of order, but actually doesn't make much difference. Okay, um, We shall talk about worry, dealing with worry. Today, there's a lot of things in this passage. And I really don't have in half an hour enough time to go through it all. But I just want to go through three main things I see. I believe our passage talks about watchfulness that involves setup, being prepared, service, being alert, and the second coming, being responsible. So what does watchfulness involve? Set up. Be prepared. Our text says, be dressed, ready for service, and keep your lamps burning, like servants waiting for their master to return from a wedding banquet, so that when he comes and knocks, they can immediately open the door for him. It will be good for those servants whose master finds them watching when he comes. Our text begins with the words, be dressed. In the original Greek, that, which is what the language, the, the New Testament was written in, the word is for, the, 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 the literal translation is, let your loins be girded, 
What in the world does that mean? Okay, let your loins be girded. In those days, Jewish men wore long robes uh, every day. That was a normal dress, even today. Okay, many uh, shepherds, whatever, just uh, you know, Jewish men in the Middle East will wear long robes. And when you want to do manual labor, they girded their loins, meaning they would tuck in the long uh, the, the, the robe into their belt so that they can work manually. Similar to us putting on our work clothes, overalls, um, jeans, uh, you know, the restaurant uniform, right? Get ready. Be prepared. Ready for service. I use the term setup. As in, you know, in a race, it says, they, they tell the, the runners, ready, set, go. Picture the Olympics, the 100 meter race these men all poised at the starting blocks set their whole life has been geared towards these next 10 seconds they're tense they're set they're focused they have avoided distractions the last many years they've focused their whole life for these next 10 seconds they're set. Jesus says, get set. Set up. In what way? Keep your lamps burning, he says. That's how the servant, the picture is these servants who are, whose master has gone to a wedding and they expect him back at any moment. Keep your lamps burning. Like servants waiting for their master to return from a wedding banquet so that when he comes and knocks, they can immediately open the door for him. They're all dressed up in their uniform. They're ready to serve him. He's coming from a long journey. It'll be good for those servants whose master finds them watching when he comes. The emphasis here is on personal readiness. Our text in verse 35 says your. In verse 40, it says you. In the Greek, the, the, the tense of the verbs, Greek has many uh, verb tenses. And the, te the tense for these verse, these, these words means it is very emphatic. You, you, get your lamps ready. You be ready personally. How did the disciples understand this? They pro See, Jesus didn't give de uh, any details at this moment. So probably they're thinking, something's going to happen. Your spouse calls you. Your boss calls you on the phone. He says, she says, get ready. Doesn't tell you what. <laughs> What's the first thing you do? You panic, right? But you think, okay, what is this that they want me to be ready for? And most likely it's not in that context, meaning the second coming okay, of Jesus Christ. Why? Because Christ hadn't left in the first place, you know, uh, yet. And so the theologians all say at this moment, they're not thinking, the disciples aren't thinking of the second coming, right? Unfortunately, that's what a lot of readers uh, believe it means. And they think that Christ is saying here, get ready for the second coming, try to predict what, when he'll come back. But we all know the Bible says we'll never know exactly when Christ come, will come back. And so we shouldn't bother trying to predict the exact date. As it says in Matthew chapter 24, verse 36, but that day or hour, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, not even the Son, only the Father. Verse 44, so you also must be ready, because the Son of Man will come at an hour when you do not expect Him. You'll never expect Him. Be ready, but you won't know exactly. First Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 2, for you know very well the day, that the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night. No one's ready for a thief, right? So don't try to predict. Many people have tried it. I, I had some friends in my former churches. Uh, one guy, unfortunately, and he's still like this. He, one day he thought he knew the exact day that Christ would come back. He started giving away all his worldly goods. He gave away his computer. He gave away his, all his music, his CDs and things like that. He gave away his TV. He gave away his, his car. Uh, he ended up going to New York. I don't know where he is now, unfortunately. There, are, there have been whole cults 
and religious groups who make it their make it their duty to, to predict when Jesus will come back. And one one reason we don't believe the Jehovah's Witnesses are true people of God is that their their organization predicted in in 1878, in 1881, in 1914, 1918, 1925, and 1975. All those dates, they said Jesus would come back. Now they say that he did come back, but it was invisible. Okay, but we know that's not the case, right? But even though we don't know when he'll come back exactly, we are called to be ready. And that's what the New Testament says over and over again. Why? Because God knows that eternity is a lot longer than the 70, 80 years we have on this earth. Or even the thousands of years of human history. Etern existence, human existence on the earth is just a little blip, a dot, a dash, a little speck compared to the vast ocean of eternity. So, Christ says, get ready. Spend more time than you would spend on anything else to be ready for Christ to come back and usher in eternity. Typical example, Matthew chapter 25, parable of the ten virgins, or bridesmaids is what we'll call them what we normally call them. At that time, the kingdom of heaven will be like ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish and five were wise. The foolish ones took their lamps but did not take any oil with them. The wise ones, however, took oil in the jars along with their lamps. Okay, so the, the custom in those days was the, the bridesmaids would be their one role is to walk with the wedding couple to the reception to the wedding banquet they were to be the uh, attendants in the torchlight procession the lamps the torchlights which were sticks with a wrap wrapped around by a, a rag dipped in oil and when the rag went out when the oil um, ran out you're supposed to have a jar of oil dip your rag dip your torch in there to keep it lit. Five wise ones had an extra jar of oil. The five foolish ones didn't have it. But in this case, the bridegroom was a long time in coming, and they all became drowsy and fell asleep. At midnight, the cry rang out, Here's the bridegroom, come out to meet him. Then all the virgins woke up and trimmed their lamps. But unfortunately, the foolish ones didn't have any oil, right? They said to the wise ones, Give us some of your oil. Our lamps are going out. No, they replied, the wise, one said, the wise one said, there may not be enough for both of us and for you. Instead, go to those who sell oil and buy some for yourselves. But while they were on the way to buy the oil, the bridegroom arrived. The virgins who were ready went in with him to the banquet, and the door was shut. Later, the others also came. Lord, Lord, they said, open the door for us. And this is the kicker. This is the surprise that Jesus always has in his parables. This is the, the dramatic reveal. But he replies, Truly I tell you, I don't know you. Jesus says, this is, a, this is more than just a little story about a wedding feast. And here's the point. Therefore, keep watch. Because you don't know when the day and the hour meaning of his return. Be ready. Readiness is a common theme in the New Testament. Are you ready and dressed for any upcoming crisis in your life? As my old teacher used to say, if you, prepare to, if you fail to prepare, prepare to fail. In the parable, the servants, how do they prepare? Their, their loins were girded, their lamps were burning. How are we to prepare for crisis in our lives? I want to use the terms learning and living. If you are a doctor right now, if you're a lawyer, if you're an engineer, if you're an electrician, if you're a plumber, if you're a gardener, what did you do? You went to a school for some learning to get the head knowledge. And then you did an apprenticeship, internship, for you did some living out 
of your profession. The servants had to learn, had to practice. We ourselves need to do the same. We need to learn, read, study, just focus and be learning, hit the books. In our case, it's the Bible, but also seminars, workshops, um, courses. You know, I remember <laughs> uh, several years back, I had an old lawnmower. And I thought, you know, I should get rid of this old lawnmower. Just, it ain't cutting as it used to cut. And I was taking forever to cut the lawn. I'd have to go over it twice sometimes. And then I mentioned this to one of my friends at church. And I said to her, you know, uh, yeah, I need to buy a new lawnmower. And she simply said to me, when's the last time you, you sharpened your lawnmower blades? And I said, what's that? <laughs> I, said, I, I didn't know that you're supposed to sharpen the lawnmower blades. And, and I had this lawnmower like 10, 15 years. How did you do that? Oh, there's these guys come around the neighborhood and they often they, they ring the bell or you take it to cane tires or something. So guess what? I, I went, I got my lawnmower blades sharpened. And guess what? I had no problems mowing the lawn. I didn't have to replace it. I still have it today. <laughs> I sharpened the saw. I sharpened the blades. That's what uh, uh, Stephen Covey talks about in his book, Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. You got to keep on learning. Sharpen the saw. Sharpen your minds. Don't just do things the same way over and over again. That's the definition of insanity, right? Expect different results. Keep on reading. Keep on growing. That's why I got my doctorate. Not because I, uh, I, I wanted the name Dr. You know, Reverend Dr. Ted Tham, not because I got more money as a in my salary. You don't, by the way, <laughs> as a pastor. Not because I want to say I'm better than anyone else. I got my doctor because I wanted to force myself to keep on learning and reading, 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 reading. That's why I take courses. I, I just did a course, uh, 16 hours online on, on, on Islam, how to share your faith with people of the Islamic faith. I didn't have to do it. I don't want to sharpen the saw. There's so many free websites and free courses out there. I encourage you. I've got a library full of books. Come to my library one day when the pandemic's over. Other than my reference material, everything else is free. Okay? You can take it. I'll give it to you. I've got too many books. Ask yourself, where do you need to learn more? Where are you ignorant? How will you do it? Make a plan right now. Keep on reading. Keep on learning. And secondly, don't just keep it in. Live it out. Practice it. Okay, you know, that's a problem with evangelicals these days. Um, I think in particular, we got, all, we got all this head knowledge, but we don't live it out. We don't experience it. We learn about faith, but we don't show it. We have this great talk about witnessing, being fishers of men, but we ain't, we have not put our our, our our we haven't cast the nets we haven't gotten out into the water we talk about the importance of discipleship during 2021 but we don't disciple others we're not a disciple and learn from the lord what's what's your weakness where do you talk a good game but you can't walk the walk or walk the talk where do you know deep down? You're just faking it. How will you do it? Get out there. Live it out. Watch this. Involves setup. Be prepared. Learning and living. It also involves service. Our text says, be dressed ready for service. Like servants waiting for their master. As Anne Voskamp once said, if you're waiting on God, do what waiters do, serve. That's what we're supposed to be doing when we're watchful, we're serving. How could we be good servants? Our text, there's many things to do, but our text seems to emphasize or focus on being alert. It will be good for those servants whose master finds them 
ready, even if it comes in the middle of the night or towards daybreak. But understand this, if the owner of the house had known at what hour the thief was coming, he would not have let his house be broken into. You also must be ready because the Son of Man will come at an hour when you do not expect him. Now, I, just want, I, I want to give you a bit of background uh, to remind you what we mean here, what Christ is talking about. All of a sudden now he makes it personal and he starts talking about himself. He says, the Son of Man. That was the way he referred to himself. But what was that? It's, it was both humble and grand. The Son of Man, when Jesus used that term, denoted both his humanity and his deity. He is fully human, also fully God. In the book of Ezekiel, the prophet referred to himself as a son of man many, many times to humbly say he's a human. Ezekiel's a son of man. Christ in our text this morning is the son of man. Not only is he human, but he's also divine. There's a passage in Jan Daniel chapter 7, very famous, verses 13 and 14, where there's a son of man who the writers, the, the, the um, theologians, and all the prophets and all that recognize to be not just a son of man. He's called a son of man, but he's really the son of God. He's divine. In my vision at night, I looked, and there, and there, before me was one like a son of man, coming with the clouds of heaven. He approached the Ancient of Days and was led into his presence. He was given authority, glory, and sovereign power. This is not just a man, okay? All nations and peoples of every language worshipped him. You don't worship man, just a man. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that will, be, that will not pass away. And his, his oh, let me read there, kingdom is one that will never be destroyed. The Son of Man. And what does our text says? He's coming back. He's the one coming back. Coming back suddenly. And the, the, now the image has changed. And Jesus is saying in this situation, there's this owner of the house. But if he would known at what hour the thief was coming, he would not have let his house be broken into. Their houses were different from us. You know, we have concrete uh, brick houses with uh, security systems and video and, and alarms and 911, you know, to call and the police and locks and doors and windows. In those days, they had brick, uh, mud brick houses made of bricks that were literally from mud, which were literally able to be broken into by a thief. They literally dug into the house and they wouldn't do it during the day, they do it in the nighttime, of course, when people are sleeping, okay, to steal things. In other words, Jesus is saying, be alert. He's going to come back like, suddenly, like a thief is sudden. Be ready. Be uh, expectant. Be alert. Anytime. You'll never know. Now, it doesn't mean be fre frenetic. It doesn't mean burn the candle at both ends. It doesn't mean don't sleep. Okay, remember in the parable of the ten bridesmaids, even the wise bridesmaids fell asleep. Okay, it doesn't mean don't go on with your regular life, but it means be alert, be watching. So the question for us is: Are we alert for service? Do we see the the opportunities all around us? I like the, the term. I, I, it may mean different things with different people, but there's a famous, um, I think it's a Latin term called carpe, de, carpe diem. Seize the day is what it means in Latin. In other words, for me it means see the opportunities all around you. Life is full of opportunities. Don't waste them. Make yourself available to God 24-7. Can you imagine if you knew Jesus is coming back this coming Wednesday, June 9th at 10 a.m.? What would you do? I know what I'd do. <laughs> I would 
use every opportunity to tell my friends about Jesus. To tell them he's coming back on June 9th, 10 a.m. I'd be praying. I'd be contacting. I'd be texting. I'd be WhatsApping. I'd be sending out on my Instagram. Hey, everyone, Jesus is coming back this Wednesday, 10 a.m. I would spend as all my money, my retirement funds, everything. I'd, 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 I'd uh, cash it all in, buy some time on the TV or whatever, on, on social media, just to tell people. He's coming back on Wednesday. Using every opportunity. I read about a visioning exercise. I think it would be helpful here. <coughs> it's called the Afterlife Dinner Party. And in this visioning exercise, the, 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 the sociologists or the counselors suggest that you envision yourself in the afterlife, after your death, in eternity, at a dinner party. And you're, you are surrounded by the different yous that were possible in your lifetime. The you who could have studied harder for your exams. The you who spent your whole life on frivolous matters, trivia, entertainment. <coughs> the you who wasted your life on alcoholism and drugs nearly died of, of a car accident. Or the you who put more time and effort into your marriage or into your parenting. Or the you who spent more time serving others in God, sharing the good news of Jesus. Then the, the counselor suggests that you look at those different yous. <coughs> Excuse me. And you ask yourself, which one do you want to talk with? Who do you want to talk with? Who do you want to be? For all eternity. Which you? For me? I want to be the serving Ted. I want to be the Ted who avoided distractions in this life. Who stayed focused on the Lord. You know, parents, we always want our kids to focus on us when they're little kids. And we have to literally sometimes lift up their face towards us to look at us. I want to be the child who looks at his parent every day. I want to, I want to have that spiritual discipline of disengagement. Not meaning go to a monastery or something, but I want to disengaged from the frivolous entertainment of this world. I'm ashamed to say that I probably know more about Marvel characters or movie stars than I know about some biblical characters. Some of you know more about math or science or geography or entertainment or sports than you know about the Bible and God's will for you. We are so caught up with this world. That's what worldliness is. It doesn't mean necessarily that we say that we hate God and we love the world more than God, but spend, spending time with the world more than spending time with God. Some people have suggested doing an extraneous media fast, meaning we do have to use some, we have to use some social media, we have to use some internet. But what one person tried was every hour he spent on the media, he would spend also with the Lord, prayer, reading the Bible, serving Him, one-to-one. -one. I want to be the Ted that asks all the time, God, what do you want me to do next after I preach this sermon this morning? What do, you, what, what do you want me to do? Prayer, the Word, reaching out to the lost, or simply sitting down and listening and praying about the cry of the broken people and the stressed out people around me? People like yourselves who are listening to me right now. I know you're going, some of you lost some loved ones recently. Some of you are going through, uh, you, you're thinking you might want to get a divorce. You want to leave your job. You want to give up on life. Why am I busy thinking about other things when you're going through such pain? Do a visioning exercise. Watchfulness means being set up, prepared, learning and living. It means service. Be alert. Carpe diem. Every opportunity. And finally, it means the second coming. Be responsible. Peter, at this point in the text, 
wants to clarify, Lord, are you speaking to us, 12 disciples, or to everyone else? Here's where Jesus expands the discussion. And he says, no, no. You know, he, he answers the questioner with another question to make him think. And we'll read the text in a second. He talks about being in charge of all God's possessions, a new heaven and new earth. He talks about being cut in pieces and assigned a place with the unbelievers, which is hell. He talks about being beaten with blows and with many blows or few blows, which is punishment in the afterlife. Because it all of a sudden gets really serious. Because the Bible is very clear. Jesus will come back one day soon when everything, everyone will have to give account. As it says in John 14, verse 3, If I go, Jesus says, if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back. Revelations 3, he says, I am coming soon. Revelations 22, look, I am coming soon. He who testifies to these things says, yes, I am coming soon. Jesus is coming back soon. And so going back to our text in Luke chapter 12, the Lord responds to Peter saying, Who then is a faithful and wise manager, whom the master puts in charge of his servants to give them their food allowance at the proper time? It will be good for that servant whom the master finds doing so when he returns. Truly I tell you, he will put him in charge of all his possessions. But suppose the servant says to himself, My master is taking a long time in coming, and then begins to beat the other servants, both men and women, and to eat and drink and get drunk. The master of that servant will come on a day when he does not expect him, and an hour he is not aware of, he will cut him to pieces and assign him a place with the unbelievers. The servant who knows his master's will and does not get ready or does not do what the master wants will be beaten with many blows. But the one who does not know and does things deserving punishment will be beaten with few blows. From everyone who has been given much, much will be demanded. And from the one who has been given entrusted with much, much more will be asked. Here's a situation. A master is absent. A long time in coming. In reality, Christ has been, it's been over two millennia. But then he comes back suddenly, unexpectedly, and he expects the manager to give account. If the manager was wise and faithful, he would have doled out the food at the proper time. He himself, the manager, by the way, is another slave, and he takes care of the other slaves. But he's also in charge of the whole estate okay and he has freedom he has choice in life if he's faithful with that stuff his reward will be promotion his service will be rewarded actually with more service okay I truly tell you he'll be put in charge of all his possessions he's given more responsibility he's given more honor he's given more see the gift we will not be sitting around playing harps on clouds in heaven we will be given different roles and positions. It will be a gift to serve more for our master. And this will not be a job that we, that we, we hate to go to in the mornings. We can't wait to get there and work for our Lord. It will be a joyful job. That will be the promotion in charge of many things. But if the manager was unfaithful and unwise, if he felt that the master was a long time in coming and he took advantage of it and he starts to be careless with a false independence he indulges his whims he beats up the other servants he eats drinks he gets drunk the reward for unfaithfulness is punishment that is severe very severe eternal death and separation from God now it doesn't mean that you'll lose your salvation if you don't work hard for God Okay, we don't earn our salvation. The Bible is clear about that. But it does mean if someone throughout their supposedly Christian life has been irresponsible, it actually means most likely they're a non-believer. If there's no fruit, it's probably not a fruit tree. And for non-believers, those who don't believe in God, the result is severe separation, eternal separations from the only life and light 
in the universe. It's severe. And there's not only is it severe, it's specific. There's very different degrees of punishment. Did you know that in hell? The Bible's very clear in that. Matthew 10, 15, 11, 22, 24, Mark 6, 11, Hebrews 10, 29. And the proportion of suffering in hell is related to your responsibility, to your privileges given on this earth. If you receive much, much is expected from you. I know some are bothered, by the way, by the text that says, what about the ignorant people? You know, the, isn't that unfair? Those who don't know will still get punished. But look carefully at the text. It says, they, they do things deserving punishment. They actually did sin. And recognize the Bible also says that there will be consequences not just for sins of commission, but also sins of omission. Just because we don't do something doesn't mean there's no consequences. It says in James 4, 17, Anyone then who knows the good he ought to do, but doesn't do it, sins. James 4, 17. Sins of omissions are also sins. So, how can we prepare? How can we avoid that punishment? Be responsible. Be a faithful and wise manager that gives its food to the other servants at the proper time. He did his job day in, day out. He was there on time. He showed up. He was responsible. He was faithful. He just didn't sit around. So my question for you this morning, are you responsible in your walk with the Lord? Companies have to give an annual report to the shareholders. Employees usually do an annual job review. We are all accountable. Have you done a spiritual inventory? Do you know what God's given you? The gifts He has given to you? You know, have you ever had a case where you end up buying something from a Costco or something, you come back home and you realize you already had it at home? (laughs) You didn't know you already had it. Do you recognize that you have so much from the Lord? Have you used it all? Every day, even during this pandemic, even the bad experiences, the tough times, the pain and suffering was all collected up and part of your experience in life that you can use for God's glory as a wounded healer, as they say. You can turn stumbling blocks into stepping stones. You can turn your mourning into dancing. You turn failures into faith. If you just have the right attitude and you recognize this is all part of the inventory God's putting in your life right now. It's the way you look at it. As Thomas Edison, the inventor of the light bulb, who tried many, many different ways to get a light bulb to work, different elements, different materials, 10,000 different types of materials before he finally hit on the one he used. He said this later on, I have not failed 10,000 times. I haven't failed once. I have succeeded in proving that those 10,000 ways will not work. And when I've eliminated the ways that will not work, I will find the way that has, that that will work. What's God put into you? Watchfulness, set up, be prepared, learning, living, service, be alert, carpe diem, second coming, be responsible, take a spiritual inventory. And I've got just one more minute or so left, but I just want to share with you the, actually the, the best part. I saved it for the last. There's this one verse in our text that I skipped earlier, but I, I, I can't miss it because it's, it's the shocking part of, this, of the parables. It is the mind-boggling verse. Christ said in verse 37, It will be good for those servants whose master finds them watching when he comes. Truly I tell you, he will dress himself to serve. The master gets dressed to serve. He will have them recline at a table and will come and wait on them. This is mind-blowing in those days. Never happened. A master serving the servants? Shocking. Almost unbelievable. But that's the way our God is. Our God is a serving God. Luke 22, Christ said, For who is greater, the one who is at the table or the one who serves? 
Is it not the one who is at the table? Well, I am among you as one who serves. What does this mean? In heaven, we're going to put up our feet and Jesus is going to come at the table, put on an apron and serve us our meals every day in bed or whatever. No, no, no. The Bible says we serve God. We are the servants, okay? But what does that mean? What does this mean? I believe what it means is this. One day in heaven for all eternity, it will be so good, such a blessing, such a joy that we will feel like kings and queens and that we are being served because God will arrange everything for us to the point where we feel like we're being served for all eternity. You know, I, I try to think of the, the closest equivalent I can think of in my life it was going to the cruise I went to once in my life. The very, uh, you know, I went to a cruise when our, when our family is very young and they do everything for you. These waiters and all that, even our children are very young, our boys are very young, and the waiters even one time when they brought a steak to the boys, cut the steak for them, okay? <laughs> cut the steak for them. Tucked in their napkins, cut the steak for them. People wait on your hand and foot. It'll feel like that for all eternity. It doesn't mean we won't be doing anything, okay? Because we have these jobs that God will give us. But there'll be jobs that'll be the greatest jobs in the universe. Jobs that we'll look forward to every day. Jobs that won't be a waste of time. No downside. Better than a dream. The best boss in the world, the best wages in the world, the best benefits, the best hours, the best use of our time, gifts, and talents. We will enjoy being in God's kingdom. It'll seem like this eternity will seem like no time at all. You know, like the Bible says, Jacob served for Rachel another seven years. And the Bible says it was like nothing for him because of his love for Rachel. Like a little boy who loves to carry the school books for the girl he's interested in on the way to school. Our God is like that. Our God is not like the God of the, you know, the, the first century people knew that. He wasn't like the gods of the Romans and the Greeks, who were so human, so evil. You know, people in those days knew instinctively that God of the Bible, Jesus, was completely different. That's why they flocked to Christianity in the first century. Or even the God of Islam, I've been studying, who is a very selfish God, very aloof, very unfeeling, very uncaring can change his mind anytime he wants, demands service to be pleased. Or the God of this culture, self-centered, selfish, everyone only caring for themselves. Our God is so different. So let's be watchful. Let's pray. Our eternal God and Father, we thank you so much for who you are. We realized this morning we just got a little taste, a little, a little understanding of how great you are and the wonderful rewards you promise for watchfulness. Help us, Lord, to be prepared. Help us to be alert. Help us to be responsible. Not because it earns us our salvation, because that's just what people do when they are a child of the living God, the eternal Father the mighty King. What a privilege. And we pray, Lord, that all our friends, all our family, all our relatives, all our workmates, all our schoolmates get to know you. Now and for all eternity, we ask. For we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. And amen. Now is the time for the Lord's table. When we get to celebrate what Christ has done for us on the cross once a month together. For all those who have been baptized publicly in confession of their faith. We hope you've got the elements with you now and we invite you to join us. Before we begin, I want to read a passage from Revelation 19 talking about the wedding supper of the Lamb to remind us of what we will go through in heaven one day. Then I heard what sounded like a great multitude, like the roaring of rushing waters, and like loud peals, 
of thunder shouting, Hallelujah, for our Lord God Almighty reigns. Let us rejoice and be glad and give Him glory. For the wedding of the Lamb, meaning Jesus, has come, and His bride, the church, has made herself ready. Fine linen, bright and clean, was given her to wear. Fine linen stands for the righteous acts of God's holy people. Then the angel said to me, Write this, Blessed are those who are invited to the wedding supper of the Lamb. And he added, These are the true words of God. Blessed, happy are those like us, God's children, who are invited to this wonderful ceremony. I can't think of a more joyful time than a wedding and a more happy time than the reception, the supper, the dinner. That's what it will be like. And that's what we foreshadow in the communion once a month, a time to rejoice, to remember that's already been finished. Our Savior has died on the cross for our sins. And He's asked us joyfully to remember this once a month. As it says in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, Christ said, This is my body, meaning the bread, symbolic of His body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's give thanks and pray for the bread that represents His body given for us. Eternal God and Father, we thank you. We rejoice despite our sins, despite all our iniquities, our rebellion against you. We are forgiven because of the blood and body of your Son broken on the cross for us for the remission of sins. Lord, we thank you for what your Son did. We ask your forgiveness. We ask your cleansing. And we pray that we would always remember that we are people redeemed by the body and blood of your Son. We thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Christ's body, broken for us. Let's eat this in remembrance of him. In a similar manner, Christ took the cup, which represented his blood shed on the cross for us. And he said, this cup is a new covenant in my blood. The new relationship, a covenant. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. Let's pray for the cup. Eternal God, we thank you for the new relationship we have with you because of the blood of your Son shed on the cross for the remission of sins. We pray that many more people, our friends, our relatives, our co-workers, our schoolmates, all those we interact with, would also repent of their sins, have their sins cleansed by the blood of your Son, be guilt-free now and for eternity. We ask, Lord, may many more people come to know you and celebrate the blood of your Son shed on the cross to pay the penalty for our sins. <coughs> we thank you, Lord, and we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's drink the cup together in celebration and remembrance of him. Amen. Please stand now as we sing the doxology, remain standing for the benediction and the amens. Let's rise for doxology. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above the 
heavenly host, as Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Let us receive the benediction from our Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you, be gracious unto you, and help you to be ready, alert, and responsible, now and until he comes. Amen. God bless you all. Amen. 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 You all may be seated. Thank you for such an amazing message, Reverend Ted. A time for the announcement. There's a summer job opened from our English ministry AV department for IT intern. Um, all the information that you need to know, it's on our ch church website, gracegospel.ca. And for the job position, contact Reverend Ted by tomorrow, June 7th. There's another summer job position opened for food bank intern. Uh, again, the job description is at church website, gcgcny.org. Contact Reverend Ted for that position as well by June 12th, Saturday. Baptism class has begun yesterday. There are four people who are going through um, baptismal preparation. It's not too late. If you want to be baptized, please let us know. Also, there will be a membership class. So if you like to be a member of our church, you've been baptized already, but you want to be a member or you want to transfer your membership from previous church, you can do so by taking this course one day, uh, on our course uh, on July 31st at noon by Reverend Franco. There's online summer retreat from July 9th to 11th for speaker, the adult, Reverend John Chen from Canadian Baptist Ministry and for teens, our um, pastor intern, Santos Chen for only July 9th Friday. There's a mental health seminar is happening tomorrow evening at 8 p.m. The Zoom link is on the screen. It's going to be hosted by Reverend Ted. So any information, you, any question you may have, please contact Reverend Ted. Church is called to do the mission work. If you'd like to be involved in our mission committee and do the work, please uh, let me know. There's online summer camp for the month of July and August uh, from Grace Christian School. Uh, you see the link there on the screen. And also if you have any question, please contact Mrs. Ng on that email address. Please check our uh, Instagram to get updated with our church news. And also we'll be uploading our pastoral video on Instagram from now. So please check the pastoral video. This week was Pastor Eva, so please uh, listen to our, our message and uh, be encouraged in your walk with Jesus Christ. Let's worship our Lord Jesus Christ. Even during this pandemic, we can do so by simply clicking at our church website, go to sermon page, and there's a worship playlist. We can praise the Lord together with the same song. Uh, the, the songs will relate to the sermon message that you'll be hearing. So it's going to be changed every week. So please click on the link. And let's worship our Lord Jesus Christ together. There is meet and greet next Sunday at 12.30. Never too late to join any of Sunday school classes. As you have heard, our church budget has gone down to 30%. All that we have, have received from Jesus Christ. Um, and it's, it's right to do so by um, giving it back to him as expression of his love on us so please do it through different methods either e-transfer credit card or phone offering you can call the number anytime uh, but not anytime tuesday to friday 10 a.m to 2 p.m to receive prayer encouragement or if you want to talk to any of us either myself or reverend ted you can call that number and we can uh, make an arrangement uh, to talk to you or get to know each other so please call that number uh, once again, the pastoral video is at our church website, but also on our Instagram. 
we have a special uh, promotional video from Genesis Ministry, our teen ministry. They're asking teens to join their bi-weekly Friday prayer meeting. For that, please contact Andrew or Lois or Dorcas. And now we're gonna watch their promotional video for asking teens to join this bi-weekly Friday prayer meeting. Let's watch the video. I'm Denise. I joined the prayer ministry because Roxanne encouraged me to. I'm Roxanne. I joined the prayer ministry team because Dorcas recommended me to. I'm Lois, and I also joined the prayer ministry because Dorcas asked me to. And I'm Dorcas, and I started the prayer ministry team because God asked me to. Hi, everyone. We are the Genesis Prayer Ministry. The purpose of prayer ministry is to connect with one another and pray for each other. We also pray for our youth fellowship, our church, the missionaries we support, and the world. Our meetings take place on our Genesis Discord server and the Prayer Voice channel. You can also check out the prayer chat to find prayer requests and share your own throughout the week. Our meetings happen every two weeks and start at 7 p.m. Our meetings last about 30 minutes and anyone is welcome to join, participate, and share. Hi Genesis! Um, I love Genesis prayer meetings because it gives me a chance to hear how people outside of my cell have been doing. Um, and it also reminds me to pray for our church and the world and for all of you. Hope to see you all in the coming weeks. At the beginning of the pandemic, I shared that my mom was going to work at a COVID ward. And um, I asked the prayer meeting to pray for her. And God answered by bringing her home safely without an infection. I joined prayer meeting because I think uh, having fellowship with other people um, was very interesting and prayer is very important. Hello, each time I joined uh, Genesis prayer meeting, my heart is filled with joy. Just listening to your voice, being lifted up in prayer and also anticipating how, will, how God will answer your prayer. So I ask you to join to this prayer meeting. And if I'm so joyful and delightful, how much more our Lord Jesus Christ is delighted as he, as he listens to your voice through prayer. So come join us. It's so um, heartwarming as teens are so passionate about coming together to pray. Uh, such, a, such a fun example to all of us. There are many prayer meetings being held at our church for teens. Andy, you just saw the video and the adults, Ted, uh, Reverend Ted, Sunday, Wednesday, and men, Kevin Ho, woman, Catherine, Saturday at noon. And you can check our church website and give your prayer support to the missionaries that our church supports. This coming Sunday, I'll be preaching titled, Do Not Worry About Your Life. Thank you for having joined to this beautiful Sunday service. May His grace be with you until we meet again. Bye.